All right. So the first thing is, uh, this is right before our Economic Outlook Conference. So I cannot give any forecasts at all because I have an agreement with the Eagle that we cannot give anything. So I'm doing a trends. I'm going to talk about different things like this. And by no means, if what I'm saying, give any indication to what you'll see in October 9th, by the way. So maybe some stuff, but you know, how do you separate the two things? So October 9th is our economic outlook conference. We're already getting, we should be close to 600 some people at the event. Got some great speakers, some great perspectives going on. With that, when we first talked about this, we said I should have about 20 minutes with 15 minutes of, of conversation or something like that. So, uh, or 10 minutes of conversation. So my amount of material is a whole lot less. So the good news is one, you have two perspectives. You can say, I'm gonna be done really fast and you can move on, or I'm done really fast and you can ask a lot of questions. I love dialogue, so you can ask any question at any point in time and uh, we can dialogue as we go through. Uh, and I, when, as I start, and, and I started thinking about this, I used to teach uh, a master's program in economic development. I talked about not only measurements of growth, but also functions of how, how an economy will grow. And so I put up here, the first one is GDP, which is the measure of, of goods and services in economy. And the ones below it, you know, primarily are functions to it, right? If you're a business, you're going to need labor, or you need, which comes from population, and, it, and income is a variable within this. And so you have all these factors, and I'm going to break it out and talk a little bit more on how they affect the economy and give you the numbers of the trends. So how's it going? And, and I'm, I'm taking off the, the kid gloves. We're, we're going full force to talk about what's exactly happening in, this in the economy. Uh, but there's a lot of things that are missing in this equation when you really want to talk about the growth of the economy. If we talk about entrepreneurship, for example, right, there's that factor. You have innovation and technology, which is a key factor in knowing how an economy is growing and what the trend and where it's going. Productivity. The amount of usage of energy is great in the research of how economies grow. And I'm not going to show that one. Uh, and then you talk about the other forms of capital. Not only financial capital, human capital, other functions of this. But for simplicity, I'm not going to cover those. I'll talk about them generically. I've done other research and I got lots of them on our website directly hitting those, but I won't get into them in a lot of detail uh, because there's no way to compare it. And he wanted me to compare it to other cities to kind of put a context or a landscape of what's going on within Wichita. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and start. Again, the first one is GDP or GRP, which is the value of goods and services being produced. And so in this, you, I want to give you a little landscape of what you see down here. First, uh, the cities I picked, if I had more time, I would probably pick maybe other cities than this. I'm not sure, sure I'm happy with the pick, but you know, I'm just trying to do it quickly for this presentation. So you got Oklahoma City, it makes sense to kind of think about them since they're so close. Kansas City, because they're a big driver in, this, in the state, and I think there's some interesting perspectives actually that, that, uh, I, that, that came up that I wasn't expecting on the Kansas City MSA, which is both sides of, of uh, Kansas and Missouri. Then you have Des Moines, where you have a more similar size agriculture economy but that's on the outside of the region. And then you have Omaha, and you have, uh, which is a, uh, an interesting perspective on the, on the region. Tulsa, we have manufacturing and energy, which has some, uh, I wish I probably had more manufacturing on this, to be honest with you. And then you have United States, which is a benchmark. And I try to put this systematically in there so you can see it. Now, one of the things that really frustrates me when people start doing presentations is they'll have these time frames, and they don't really explain the impact of that time frame. So I did two here, and there's actually pretty important for this. The first one you'll see is 2001 to 2007. This is the economic cycle, and that is very important. At the national level, what was that, where do we start and where do we go to, to, com to compare them? And now, within that economic cycle, it's important to know Wichita actually went through a business cycle. So actually, although in this period of time, you can see over here in blue, Wichita went up, we actually had a downturn in our business cycle in aerospace. So even if that is very difficult to have a consistent comparison of, of multiple places if you're just looking at, at lining these cities up, when you're looking at these differences like this. 
So then I threw in another one. It would have been nice to have a few more years to it, but I did 2001 to 2013 to have a really long time frame. So if you get very long, it doesn't matter what business cycles or economic cycles, you're still seeing that long-term growth and how are you comparing these economies from each other. That way we have it a little bit of a comparison to it. So with that, it's pretty clear, the ones that I picked, uh, you can see both Kansas City and Wichita you know, are far to this. If I was able to pull all MSAs, and you know, you have to limit on my time of how much I was in a pull, but most MSAs in the nation are actually on the right side of the United States number. What you'll see is all the rural areas is really on, most of the rural areas across the United States are really on this left side, and MSAs are the ones that have been growing. There are some other manufacturing ones that, that have also declined, and in retrospect, I should have grabbed a couple other ones to compare it, but it does put, in this context for these, Wichita does look fairly dismal on this. Now, what's the problem with this is still when you look at numbers, we want to normalize the data, get it all the way down so you see see without these other variables went to it. And one of the ones that you like to use is divided by population. So this is the amount of goods and services divided by the number of people there, right? That gets down to a very core number of what you're looking at. And when you throw that variable in, you get an interesting perspective. One is Kansas City, actually, went over to the left side. That's the one I kind of caught my eye right, right away. But Wichita, if you look at the very long term, drops even more. So you see the per capita GDP, it actually goes down further relative to the other counterparts. Now, here's another numbers thing. I'm going to be overly geeky on numbers. And the amount of time I did this, I did the annual average. So I took every single year and averaged them. And with that, that's what made Kansas City really go shift further over. They had a couple periods where they had negatives. And because they had a couple of periods, it just factored in and make them go over there. If I did compound or simple average, Kansas City would have been on the other side because of the, what happened with GDP for Wichita. It's just a math number giving you a perspective there. But still, either way, Wichita really is, is not looking very good compared to these, these uh, cities over there. Oh, there's the value if you wanted to know per capita for Wichita is 45,700. So. so the another factor to this is that, okay, when you look at GDP, and you probably have heard this, it measures a lot of other things. One of it, it measures government spending. It measures other factors. And so I said, okay, what's a real driver to economy? And it really comes down to businesses and private sector. And so I throw in here for private sector GDP versus total GDP, the percent growth for, and I don't have the time period, but this is that longer time period from 2001 to 2013. And what you see is all the way over on the right side of the screen, you see actually larger differences between their total and private for Oklahoma, Des Moines, Omaha, Tulsa, and so forth. And when you start thinking the fundamentals behind this, and my real uh, position here is this is the invisible hand working. It's really the market forces that are creating these economies that are going forward. And when you look at that, I can explain a lot of the growth fairly simple and without putting a lot more effort into this. When you look at Oklahoma City, we know there's an energy sector that really drove that sector. You also have the finance sector and some unique manufacturing that has done really well. They were in sectors where aggregate demand, not only in, within the region, state, and the global economy, the aggregate demand increased because they were happened to be in a segment that was a factor that was going to increase. Second one, Des Moines, Iowa. You look at the insurance industry. Well, they had insurance before, but if you look at previous cycles, what happened during this time? Insurance happened to pull up significantly, and the agriculture wealth surrounding Des Moines actually flooded that regional economy and helped it grow during this period of time. Omaha, here's another one. You look at Omaha, well, we know the transportation sector, we know the uh, finance sector there have, were the primary growths for Omaha. Tulsa, we've got, we got the energy production side of that, and then uh, was the main factor for the Tulsa one. So when you start looking at these, I mean, I can easily explain fairly clearly that it was just in segments that actually drove most of those markets when you start looking at those. And then you get all the way down to Wichita, uh, as I'll start, you know, I'll go in more detail later. It's really the market segment and aggregate demand for aerospace, which I'll start getting in more and more detail. Let me pause. I'm kind of getting really technical on this. What are your thoughts so far or questions? Yes? What's the new graph that uh, we should use more money in private hands? 
So So nowhere in here am I looking at how much government funding is in any of these. So in Oklahoma City, for example, it is actually a counter argument to that, though, right? There are some other of these cities that are putting more money into it. So you, you got to be careful of taking that too far. It's just looking at private sector. And my point is really, it's the private industry and aggregate demand for that industry, which is really driving that growth. This is the percent change in GDP growth. This is average annualized growth see, every single year over the time period. So we're not really, although government's in there, I just wanted to make sure we show the private side, that private industry, which has that aggregate demand, I think is the real function of this. Oh, oh maybe you're not seeing that. So red is private for Oklahoma, and then right next to it is total GDP, right? Absolutely. So private is a driver for all of the economies. You'll see it on all of them. But it doesn't have a factor on how much they're spending, which is, I think, what you're alluding to, right? I'm just saying that, that you know, if you're counting all GDP, it's not growing as much as private. Should private keep less money out of the private? Because private's what's going to grow more. So... In this case, we're not really, I mean, I'm not, we'd have to take another analysis to go and analyze how much government has affected it, but that's not the, the context of this. But no, no, I, you, so private sector is the driver for economies by all means. I mean, yeah, that they're going to drive an economy by, by that number, so clearly. But, but yeah, another question? All right, so then I start thinking about the general growth theory. And it's pretty clear that in an economy, when it starts growing, oh, do we want to move some more here? Is the table in the way too? All right, there you go. So now you can see a little bit better. When you look at an economy in general growth theory, what you really want to see in an economy is a consistent upward growth pressure. Now I want you to think a little bit, not only government expenditures and capital, and think also about private expenditures and capital and a business. If you're in an economy, you go through a recession, right, and where we're at, and it stays pretty low, and you have a general low growth, right, when you have all these capital investments, you have no other regional aggregate demand to help take off that pressure. Right? But if you're in an economy that's growing a little bit faster and you have this general growth, although you might have a downside of the economy, people are still growing, are starting to, to come back. It actually will take away some of that burden of capital expenditures and the other investments that you've done. So, in a general growth economy, right, and you want that consistent growth, and if you actually have accelerated growth, it makes it very difficult for our economy as well. So, in the long run, you want that consistent growth over time. And although I said population really is a function of employment that actually drives the private sector, there is ways in which you have the population actually driving the business. So although businesses will, will raise their wage and try to track them to them, we also have businesses now going after the, where the population or the labor supply might be. Right? So it kind of goes a little bit both ways. So when you look at this and you look at over time, it's pretty clear Wichita is a very slow, it's more consistent growth, but until recently, fairly consistent growth, but very low growth economy. There's another thought that you see out there, which is a growth pole. It says, at some point, we don't always understand why people keep moving to locations without job opportunities. They're just moving there. Uh, so you can talk about amenities and actually... Um, uh, Nathan was kind of hinting at some of those amenities, and I think you were bringing up a little bit of quality of life, so there's some factors to it. But when they've done research, they said there are still some unexplained variables why sometimes people start moving to a location. And because that movement, and you're seeing that in the last couple de decades, people keep moving to MSAs, even though there's not always a labor opportunity. Because they're moving there, it creates this driving force, and businesses are actually following those companies because that's where the labor supply is, 
right? So there is a factor that over, over growth, you have a growth pole where it continues to grow and continues to attract more people. And then you have the opposite of that. So if you're not attracting people, you also start declining and slowing down that growth over a period of time. So the next one, and I love this. You hear all this news about unemployment, and if you look at unemployment right now, it looks like we're in a fairly good position. The, the unemployment number is really not very useful in describing the labor market and what's going on. This is why I love this slide, and I wish people would see this more often. It's very simple. Uh, in this slide, you just take total employment divided by the total population. You cannot escape it. You can't have a discouraged worker. You can't have a marginal worker. You can't have any other kind of worker. It is just total people by total jobs. And there's no other uh, questions about part-time or anything like that. This is just the total engagement of the labor force. So it makes it very simple. I won't go into the details of why Kansas and, and Cedric County are above, but if you want to talk to me, I can explain why they're higher than the U.S. average. What I want you to do is look at it over time and look at the trend in this. First, you see this big overall hill. It's pretty simple. You have baby boomers, and a unique period of time, we were at full growth. We were using people in the labor market in multiple marginal ways, right? They were probably not a very good worker, but we engaged them anyway because it was full growth part of our economy. And now look what we're at right now. We had a recession. We had a lot of baby boomers who are now retiring and has exited this labor force. So the population's still there. So the expectation for us to go back to where we had this last peak is really unreasonable. We are not gonna go back to that last peak. But the, really, the question we have is what is the direction and how engaged that labor market over the time? And you actually see it is pretty small. This goes all the way in 2014, we just updated it. You can see at the US level, it is slowly, slowly improving, going up, going up, going up. But it is improving in the labor market. Uh, definitely not this here, no, the news you hear about unemployment and other labor force, which is a, a very difficult message. For Sedgwick County, which is an important part, you see a huge drop, much more dramatic, and you see a continuous drop down. So what do you look at this number? The first thing you can say is not only is going down, that means b businesses here do not necessarily need the labor that is available. Right? We have an excess labor supply. There are people out there that businesses don't really want because they're not being hired. Now, you've got to ask a question. Why are businesses coming to me and saying they can't find employment when we have our labor population ratio so low? Then that gets to a very simple question. It happened in the national level. There's that mismatch of labor. I think that's been brought up a couple times. It's a structural thing in this labor force. We have people who are laid off who have different skills than what people are wanting to hire. And so the question here for our labor market and what we're dealing with is not only people, the businesses are not necessarily wanting to hire them, but we also have people who have skills that are not matching the labor force. That's a trend and an issue that we have to think about as a community. How do you re-engage them? Are there... Uh, and, and here's another question. Why isn't this a signal to other businesses to come? All right, if we have all this excess labor supply, and if we start talking about talent and productivity and things like that, if you talk to Spirit, I've asked them before, what are your thoughts about this labor market versus the other locations? And they're pretty candid, the HR people. The labor market here is actually much better by candid comments. I mean, I, we're not really proving it, but they think it's better here, Right? So if the labor market is so much better, why isn't this a signal to businesses to come? This is something we should start being thinking, right? This should be a signal. We have it. And I'm going to show you the next one, which is really the canary. Oh, not this one. But here's total non-farm, then I'll get into the next one. Here's total non-farm employment. This is employment over time. I will say, you got to look at the bottom. This is a change in time. Uh, you, uh, I grabbed what's available from the BLS, and uh, they didn't have it to 2001, and I didn't want to go back and really capture this. So there is a change, just so you can see that versus my other slides. That's the only reason why Wichita has a really huge jump, because we went our business cycle down and our business cycle coming back up to, from 2004. So it makes it look like Wichita is doing really well because we just happened to hit a business cycle up during that period of time. But if you over the very this long run, you can see it's much, much weaker uh, on our labor side compared to all, all of them. So here's the next one. And I, this is a story we tell locally. The story we tell locally is this is a great cost of living, and that's a great conversation. 
uh, you know, definitely attractive in a lot of ways to, to people thinking, oh, I can have a lot more uh, for the cost that I have. But here's another side to this equation. This is per capita personal income. And the way I divided this is every MSA divided by the U.S. So you can see them all comparative. And when you look at a, at a labor market like this, income is the price signal that attracts industry, right? If you start, if you start or in labor, if you start, um, start raising your wages, what does, that tell, and what does that tell labor? It says, come here, come here, come here. And we went through a period, and you look all the way back when the labor market for Wichita was much higher. And you might not be able to see the color very well, so I'll go up here and show it to you. Here's Wichita. We get all the way up to the peak, and then we start going down. And you can see Wichita going all the way through here. But it's been actually a long period. And when you look at, at income, and income is the best price signal for a labor market, right? It is the one that will attract labor, or it should be attracting industry, right? If you're in industry, and you look at over time, what is the importance of labor as an overall product? And, and over time, if you look at the labor component, it's gotten more expensive and is in a more important component of most industries, right? That should be the best price signal for companies to come here. The question is, why aren't they coming? And actually, not only why aren't they coming, really we had we already knew something was going on in our labor. Do you know what's going on? We've had uh, several layoffs. You already know the story about aerospace. We laid them off. We have excess labor supply in production workers, which is putting down repressors. And you've got to think about this in even context. When you get a salary, we have this thing called sticky wages. As soon as you get a wage, you don't want to go back down, right? You don't, you're not willing to go down. But there has been downward pressure on the wage within this labor market for some time relative to the other people, right? Relative to other people, we have a downward pressure in this overall labor market. And although it makes, sound, again, sound good that we have a great cost of living, right? That's great to sell. But it is also a sign that there are other labor things, labor issues going on within this regional market. All right, so here's some summary of what I've talked about so far, and I won't go through all of this. We have the lowest GDP um, growth rate. Per capita is very weak. The biggest point here is, and we need to really, I guess I didn't get into it much, aggregate demand. I said there's more aggregate demand for those businesses in some of these other markets, and it's clear, right? I mean, I, you could, I, I saw people's heads shaking. You kind of realized the reason why they grew is because they were in industry segments that were in points where new aggregate demand was being created, and they were growing. It's pretty clear to see that. For Wichita, and here's the harsh reality to this, is the aggregate demand for aerospace structurally changed over time? And the answer is, seems to be pretty clear, yes. Unfortunately, the amount of demand for the general aviation plane, planes that we have is structurally different. It will come back up eventually, but the utilization of labor is going to be different, and that's how I'm going to get into the next argument, thinking about uh, what's the trend within this industry a little further. So, you know, aggregate demands change. That puts it in a, in a pretty soft position for this regional economy. Uh, population growth is low, and you know when you have that growth pole and you have different growth periods, we don't have enough labor coming from that population. That puts other pressures on our economy. And I think you get the point of that. All right, so let me talk about industries. I love these slides. This is, again, a little bit more technical and geeky on these slides. I show this quite a bit, and I added a little bit of uh, two time periods here just because we had two different time periods. I'm going to show Kansas, and then I'm going to show South Central Kansas here. So I show you this so you can show the geography that I use. And it's pretty simple. You look at this. You look this line right here that has this darker blue. Anything above it says we have a higher concentration in whatever industry it's in. Anything below that line says we have a lower concentration relative to the U.S. Anything to the right of the light blue means we had a relative expansion is relative to the U.S. So don't quote these numbers. This is a relative position. Anything to the left is a relative contraction. The size of the bubble is the total, total wages from that industry. And we only picked the top five employment sectors for any given time period or whatever it was. What was the top five, right? I'm trying to simplify this message of what's going on, what we look like. So here's Kansas. What this says is we're 1.3 times more concentrated in manufacturing during this growth period. And this went two years over the, the recession, but it's still pretty good for it. 
We're 1.3 times more concentrated, and we had a relative expansion right before or right into the recession. We were a little bit late in the recession as the U.S., but we started hitting it in 2008. Then you can, well, you can see the other ones, healthcare, retail, and so forth. Perspective here, the quadrant you want to be in is in the top right. You want those, to, you want your sectors to be in the top right. The quadrants you don't want to be in is the top left, because that means you're highly concentrated in a sector that's declining relatively. Next one here, South Central Kansas. You saw you, um, Kansas was 1.3. Look how much more concentrated we are in manufacturing during this period of time. We're over two times more concentrated. And you look at the size of the bubble, it's huge. This is the total wealth. This is where, this is where wealth is created, right? Although he said primary industries, and his assumption was that primary industries didn't include services, primary industries actually does include services. It does anything that is actually exporting something out of our market in any format. It doesn't matter if it's a Western Kansas or anything. When you look at it, a sector, anything that's bringing new dollars into an economy is a primary industry by definition. And the manufacturing not only creates wealth, it drives this economy, it drives the state economy. Matter of fact, aerospace, drive, aerospace not only drives here, it drives the whole state economy. Now, I'm going to change the time periods. And now you have Kansas, but you have more recent on Kansas. And you see this manufacturing, our relative concentration has dropped. And it just moved to the, just to the left side to a relative contraction compared to the U.S. What you see over there is actually kind of interesting. Finance and insurance is not that we are great in finance and had this great expansion just because we didn't have the, those big bank failures that they did at the national level. We had a lot of farm credit and some other industries that actually had done well because of the farming industry. That's the only reason why it showed up. And we're looking to 2012. If you go to 2013 with the mergers, it's probably going to look not as great. So let me flip this one more. Here is South Central Kansas. Remember, we were over two times more concentrated. Our concentration dropped significantly, and now we're in all the way a relative contraction. Now, when you talk about a primary sector, one that's creating wealth, and you look at manufacturing, it definitely creates wealth. When we produce something, we get new dollars into this economy, and those other support sectors, like retail, is clearly a support sector. It doesn't really matter. They're going to take those dollars, and they've turned it around the local economy. Retail over here had a relative expansion and is, is pretty meaningless unless we're selling it outside this region. We're just consuming, that's what we're consuming locally. We just consumed more. I can tell you why it went over there. It's actually because not people here, it's the wealth from Western Kansas and from the oil. We had more retail relative to the US and that's why we were spending some. You go over to healthcare and social assistance. Healthcare could be a more of an export, but most of it is not. Most of it is a support sector. We have the same number of doctors. We do export some of it to Western Kansas, but it's not a growth sector. And then you look at uh, combinations of food services. That's technically the one. I mean, people are doing, bringing money in here to our economy, but a pretty low paying one. And then you have administrative and waste management. Administrative is management of companies. Think about the headquarters we just lost recently. And that's really what's pushing that headquarters over there. Now that is a growth sector. But those are top five employing sectors in this economy, and they're, it's not in a great position. 